Okay, we've got one minute to say happy birthday to uh, to Paul, who was 60 yesterday. So happy birthday. Paul. Oh, happy birthday, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday. There's, there's cake left here, so I'm going to have some afterwards. Right. Well, if anyone else joins, they can uh, be let in as we go. Can you pop yourself on mute if you're, uh, if you know how? Well. That's it, right. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Saturday matinee lecture. I've chosen the subject for this week of the Oert cloud, and I imagine that most people have heard of the Oert cloud, but um, I thought it was worth digging into the history of it a little bit and the nature of it and what we know, and what we don't know. And it goes back, well, mostly it goes back to this guy, Jan Oert, who was the first to propose that the solar system might have this enormous cloud of icy material around it, way out in the deep uh, parts of uh, the edge of the solar system. And uh, he gave it the name, the Oert Cloud, or other people decided to call it after him because he was uh, quite um, vocal about it in the 1950s. But the idea goes back a little further. 1907, Lenscher had the idea that he was looking at the orbits of a number of uh, comets and they were, <laughs> thought to be on parabolic orbits, as in very long orbits that were open, such that they were going to pass the sun once and never come back. But he realized that quite a few of them, when you did the analysis, seemed to be actually very long closed orbits with periods of millions of years. And then in 1932, Ernst Oppik from Estonia actually said, well, it looks like they might have a common origin of a cloud of orbiting objects, um, might well be the source of some of these long period comets. But it was very much uh, then taken up 20 years later by Jan Oert, as we've said. So if we think about comets and we start to look at the uh, nature of the comets that we see coming through the solar system with their amazing tails, they seem to be able to be grouped into a number of different uh, categories. We, we love categorizing things, don't we? So we've got short period comets, and these tend to be in the plane of the ecliptic, that is where the planets orbit. So we tend to find that the solar system is basically flat, and most of these short period comets lie within that same plane. And they have orbital periods ranging from just a few years right out to perhaps a hundred years or so. And we, we refer to these all as short period comets. And we can further subdivide them into Jupiter family comets. There seem to be quite a number that have periods um, uh, that seem to be related to the orbital period of Jupiter and their uh, farthest distance from the sun, their aphelion, is around about five astronomical units, five Earth sun units, uh, and that's where Jupiter orbits at five AU. So it, it seems there are quite a few associated with Jupiter. And then there are more that have longer orbits, such as Comet Halley, which gives its name to this class, the Halley class comets, and that's in a 78 year long orbit. So it carries it out into the outer solar system. 
So let's have a look at Camp uh, Comet Halley. It orbits entirely within the, the realm of, that we associate with the planets of the solar system. Aphelion is 35 astronomical units. That's just beyond the orbit of Neptune, which is 30. And perihelion, 0 0.5 AU. So that's really quite close to the sun. And the orbit is tilted at just 18 degrees. So this is uh, a rough sort of impression of Halley's Comet and the orbits of the four giant planets there clearly visible. So the outer one there in blue is Neptune, then in turquoise we've got Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and then the inner solar system. Well, you can just about make out the orbit of Mars, but the rest are all too tightly packed to see on that diagram. And so it whips around on this highly elliptical orbit, uh, ranging over those distances, but very much um, still associated with the size and scale of the orbits of the planets. If we look at that from a, a different perspective, you can see where uh, the long elliptical orbit goes. And we've got some dates on here. And you can see that actually uh, Comet Halley is I'll use the mouse pointer, roughly here, it's going to reach its furthest distance from the sun just in three years time in 2024, and then be on its return leg again. Um, so it uh, seems only a few years ago that it was passing the Earth. But uh, it's such as the speed with which it whips through the inner solar system and back out again. Out there it is almost as far away as it can get. And so that's a Halley class comet. It seems to be associated with the outer solar system. And then we have the long period comets. And these have orbital periods that are considerably longer from thousands to millions of years. And their orbits seem to be random in the terms of the alignment to that flat plane of the solar system, the ecliptic. And the picture here is Hale-Bopp from uh, 1997, which was a typical example of a long period comet. Now, what Jan Oert noted was that there was a peak in the number of these long period comets that had an aphelion, a, a maximum distance from the sun, at around 20,000 AU. So compare that with Halley, which is 35 AU. This was the better part of uh, 600 times further out. A huge increase in scale. Here's another picture of uh, Hale-Bopp from 97 with its dust tail in white and the ionized electrically charged ion tail in blue being deflected away by the sun's magnetic field there. Uh, and its orbit is uh, thousands of years. Now you can see the date of the next visit is going to be 4385. Um, Aphelion 370 AU, so 10 times further away than Halley, and at a tilt of 89.4 degrees, almost at right angles to the plane of the solar system. So there's uh, just a, a rendition of the in our solar system and hail bop there. And you see it had a close approach to Mars there on the way out. And now it's uh, slowing down as it disappears out from the solar system. And if you look at it, it with this plane of the solar system flat, you can see that trajectory it came in over the top and then disappeared out almost at right angles away from the uh, almost from the pole of the sun. So quite a uh, inclined orbit. So just to put a sense of scale into things, we're talking about the inner part of the solar system here on sort of one and two AU out to Mars and the asteroid belt, five astronomical units out to Jupiter. Then we can jump scale over here and plot the outer solar system out to perhaps 35 astronomical units um, where Comet Halley terminates its orbit. J 
jump out again to the uh, Kuiper belt and the scattered disk in the orbit of Sedna, uh, where it takes 11,000 years to go around, um, and then jump again over to this scale here to the sort of 20,000 astronomical units, which is where some of these comets seem to come from. And that's labeled there as the inner extent of the Oort cloud. But that Oort cloud goes from perhaps 1,000 AU on its very inner edge out to beyond 100,000 AU, maybe 2,000 to 200,000. So it's a very, very uh, distant region and uh, covers an enormous volume as well. Um, again, here's the inner planets. And this is a, one of those logarithmic scales. So if Earth is one, Saturn is 10. Um, and the edge of the solar system, as regards the limit where the solar wind peters out and the sun's magnetic field uh, becomes weaker than that of the rest of uh, the interstellar space is about 100 AU. Um, and as you can see, we've got Voyager 1 marked on there. I think it's at about 120 AU now. And then, of course, a vast expanse before we get to the beginnings of the, the Oort cloud. So we think that it surrounds the whole of the solar system in a more or less spherical manner. So you've got the inner part of the solar system in here with the Kuiper belt and Neptune and everything else in this little box. And then this vast sphere, which we've got a cutaway drawing of, uh, of these icy bodies that are the progenitors of comets swarming around in every possible direction. And it's because of that near spherical symmetry that the comets can fall in from any angle when they're on these very, very long trajectories. Now, the curious thing that we need to consider, though, is that comets don't last forever. Comets quite often fade out. If they make multiple passes of the sun, each time they do so, material is boiled off the nucleus. You can see that in action here. Um, the nucleus embedded in the middle of the coma there as the material is boiled away by the heat from the sun. And every time they do that, of course, they lose mass. So each time the uh, comet passes the sun, it's going to be denuded of volatile material until eventually it runs out. And some comets do go extinct. And we, we notice that they are um, just orbiting around. They look a bit more like asteroids at that point, And really, there's uh, not a, a hard, fast def defining line between those two. Another way that comets can get wiped out is total destruction by collision with a giant planet, or indeed a not so giant planet, but they're quite likely to encounter one of the four giant planets and crash into it, pulled in by its strong gravity. And of course, that's what happened here to comet Schumacher-Levy 9. And you can see the impact scars there on the disk of Jupiter. And this other picture is the fragmented nature of the comets that had come too close to Jupiter on the previous pass and been torn apart into lots of little cometlets, each of which then crashed into Jupiter next time around. But a third way that we can uh, find that comets get lost is if they have a near miss with a giant planet, they can get ejected um, instead of captured by the giant planet and eaten, they can get uh, slingshot out of the solar system and actually pick up energy. Depends whether they're traveling with the planet or against it and whether they're going in front of it or behind it as to whether they pick up extra speed and get slingshot away out of the solar system, perhaps never to come back, or whether they get slowed down and captured. So they can get lost that way. Now, talking of captured, here is one where we saw it become captured. I think this is quite an interesting event. Comet Wild was on an orbit that is marked in yellow there, that went beyond the orbit of Uranus um, and came in and just grazed past the orbit of Jupiter. 
uh, we call orbits like that centaur orbits named after the family of objects that uh, were detected in 1976 onwards with object Cowell um, and uh, it's now called Chiron. Uh, a number of these centaurs on these elliptical pla planet crossing unstable orbits. But Comet Wild was on a very similar orbit, came too close to Jupiter and became captured, not into an orbit about Jupiter, but uh, an orbit that uh, is one of these Jupiter family comets. So it changed from a centaur like to a Jupiter family uh, comet like orbit uh, with the uh, switch made because it came too close to Jupiter. So the, the orbits of comets can evolve and often what we find is they, they undergo a number of these near misses and perhaps it'll have another near miss with Jupiter and then get deflected onto yet another orbit which could kick it out of the solar system or could capture it into orbit around Jupiter. So the question is what's going on here because if comets are routinely wiped out or denuded of material then the fact that we still see them with the solar system being as old as it is means that they must be being replenished from somewhere and this is where the idea of the Oort cloud comes in again that they have been hanging around out in the Oort cloud for many thousands of years many millions of years and then something's happened that's nudged them into uh, falling in towards the sun and the inner part of the solar system and perhaps that was a near miss with another Oort cloud object but they they lose speed fall in towards the sun and a new comet comes into existence and that this must be a fairly regular occurrence to keep us fed with these comets that uh, get destroyed or um, denuded of material every time they pass the sun. And of course once they are captured onto a short period orbit then they pass the sun far more often so a Jupiter family comet passes the sun every five years on a close approach so it very rapidly loses all its volatiles whereas one on a orbit like Halley only goes anywhere near the sun um, once every 76 years and therefore uh, doesn't lose as much material uh, over a period of say a thousand years. And we think that such a nudge might have occurred. This is the story of Schultz's star and I love this picture but it's sadly not true. Um, here's a Neolithic uh, man stood looking up with his spear at this bright red object in the sky. The idea is that uh, in 2013 Schultz's star was discovered to be one of the sun's near neighbours at only 22 light years from us and uh, they worked out that it was moving away from us and it had been closer in the past and backtracking the orbit we realised that it had uh, passed by the solar system really quite closely so Schultz's star is in fact a binary system. It comprises a red dwarf, an M M9 type red dwarf, which is about the smallest red dwarf you can have. Um, only 8.6% of the mass of the sun. And we think the lower limit for a red dwarf star or any type of proper star at all really is 7.5%. Uh, so at 8.6 percent it's really on the tiny side of things and its companion that orbits around it is even smaller it's 6.5 percent and is a type t5 brown dwarf so a failed star now these two orbit round each other 0.8 of an astronomical unit apart so about the distance that venus orbits the sun in a four year long dance um, and they're very dim indeed and that's why I say that picture of the, the uh, caveman there is not quite right because the estimate of the maximum brightness of the uh, star is about magnitude 11 and so unless he had particularly sharp eyes 
I know he would have had no light pollution. He probably wouldn't have been able to see this um, and it wouldn't really have looked like that artist's impression, but it's a nice idea. So what we think happened is that 70,000 years ago, it came within uh, 52,000 astronomical units of the sun. And that would mean that it passed through the Oort cloud. And in the process, it would have deflected a whole lot of those uh, cometary bodies that are out there. And so we should expect quite a wave of uh, comets to be falling into the inner solar system as a result of the chaos caused by this. And you might say, well, that's not happening. But once a comet has been disturbed out at that distance, it's going to take about two million years before the uh, resulting comet falls in from 50,000 astronomical units down to the meet, its meeting with the sun. So a two million year long trajectory and th this event only happened 70,000 years ago so it could well be that it's created a rain of comets that are all heading into the inner solar system now and that uh, could result in a number of impacts um, on earth moon jupiter everywhere um, in, in a couple of million years time of course uh, you and i will not be around to see it but uh, it's quite interesting to see how this sort of event could be the forecast of uh, some real quite dangerous situation. So that's a real world example of the Oort cloud being disturbed and causing a wave of comets to come in. There are other ideas. There's a hypothetical planet given the name Tyche, which is supposed to be on a long elliptical orbit, a sort of planet nine but on an orbit that goes out and crosses through the Oort cloud and brings rains of comets every so many million years onto the inner solar system. Um, it's probably not true, but it's not really quite possible to rule it out either. The same can be said for this uh, idea of the Nemesis hypothesis, which suggested that every uh, 27 million years or so, the sun encountered a small red dwarf star which was on a very very long elliptical orbit that brought it close to uh, the, the sun and close enough to disturb the Oort cloud on that sort of time scale and the reason that was suggested was because of an apparent periodicity of about 25 to 27 million years in the mass extinctions here on earth which could be the result of uh, the unleashing of a rain of comets by such an object. Well, I don't think uh, there are any undiscovered red dwarfs in our neighborhood. We've had a very good look for them. And so I think uh, Nemesis probably isn't there, but it wouldn't have to be sh um, uh, necessarily caused by just one object. There are other reasons why rains of comets might occur on a regular basis to do with the sun's journey around the uh, galaxy, in fact, as it uh, passes in and out of the spiral arms, for example. Now, just going to say a, a quick word about uh, the idea of a hill sphere, because you might ask, how does the sun hang on to all of those cometary objects when they're so far away? The sun's gravity must be very weak at that distance. And we can work that out. Um, so it, the hill sphere of an object is the zone in which it itself is the dominant gravitating force uh, projector. So the sun has a hill sphere around it, the earth does, so even does the moon. And we can see here the earth moon sun system, um, the big blue circle here, any object lying within this blue circle around the earth, the hill sphere of the earth, is do dominated by the earth's gravity and not so much uh, affected by that of the sun. Unless it goes inside this darker circle here, which is the 
hill sphere of the moon with respect to the earth so if you get fr from the earth far enough towards the moon into the moon's hill sphere region then the moon's gravity is going to take over and control how you uh, then navigate another way of looking at the same idea is we can look at this diagram which is like a contour map of gravity around the earth sun system uh, indeed it would work for any two bodies uh, that would produce this sort of effect so near the sun you have a roughly circular spherical region in which the sun's gravity is dominant and the effect of the earth is irrelevant likewise a much smaller region around the uh, outside of the uh, the earth and then you have these other points the Lagrange points L1 2 3 4 and 5 where the gravity of the two objects is equal and so neither of them is going to affect you so you can actually park at L1 and the gravity of the sun and the earth will be in balance and cancel out but you can see the these regions here these are the hill spheres okay and there's a mathematical formula for it and you can plug the numbers in which we won't worry about for now but if we plug the numbers in for the earth and the moon so we put the moon's mass in there and the earth's mass in here the big m we can work it out and the uh, hill sphere of the earth is 1.5 million kilometers and anything that's within a third of that distance is really solidly captured by the the main body so the moon orbiting around at 0.35 million kilometers or thereabouts is inside that thoroughly solidly captured region so there's no danger that the moon is going to wander off in fact if you want to fly to the moon you have to think about this sort of thing and the the uh, gravity of the, the two objects and how the relative strength of them varies and the way you uh, plot your mission is to uh, start off fr from earth on an elliptical orbit fire your engines to send you off towards the moon and aim to just arrive at the touching point of uh, where the uh, gravity is equal and then fire your engine again to tip yourself into the moon's hill sphere into its sphere of influence and just as a bit of fun I worked out the hill spheres for a few objects so this astronaut to, uh, floating outside the uh, space station here um, he's not able to orbit around the space station the gravity of the space station itself its own mass creates a hill sphere but it's only one meter in diameter which means it's actually inside the spacecraft so you can't get into orbit um, around the spacecraft because uh, you are outside its hill sphere and inside that of the earth so you are going to co-orbit the earth whether you like it or not in that situation if you were to fly further away and go and visit perhaps on some expensive repair mission you went out to one of the communications satellites in uh, the Clark belt in the geostationary orbit position around the earth so 35,000 kilometers 22,000 miles above the surface of the earth you could as an astronaut orbit around a large spacecraft you'd uh, have to be very careful because it wouldn't take much of a kick for you to uh, gain escape velocity from that rather small gravitational field of the thing but you're now far enough away from the earth that uh, you can create a, a situation where you were in orbit around the satellite and of course the Rosetta mission met up with Comet 67P shown here and orbited around this comet which is not a particularly massive object uh, but it was at about five astronomical units from the Sun and therefore it was able to get inside the hill sphere of the comet which was 670 kilometers in uh, radius 
Uh, in fact, I think uh, Rosetta orbited the nucleus of the comet at around 30 uh, kilometers, so well inside that. And of course, it also works for asteroids. This is the Dawn, an artist's impression of the Dawn spacecraft arriving at uh, Ceres, the uh, largest of the asteroids. A little bit further away from the sun than we are at 2.8 astronomical units. And so the balance points where Ceres would lose its grip and the sun's gravity would take over the hill sphere of Ceres is 22, uh, sorry, 220,000 kilometers. So um, Dawn had plenty of room for maneuver with different uh, sizes of orbits. And in fact, of course, it's still there. And then if we look at Neptune, uh, because Neptune is so far from the Sun and is a fairly substantial body itself, it's got an absolutely enormous region around it. Its hill sphere radius is 116 million kilometers. Uh, so that's a, a vast region of space that it's dominating. Um, and of course, it's got a family of moons. Triton, the largest one, is uh, like our moon, orbits at about 0.3 uh, million kilometers, so uh, over 300 times inside that uh, region dominated by Neptune. And there's a sort of chart of the hill sphere sizes for different um, solar system bodies. So we've already mentioned Neptune is in fact the biggest. Um, Ceres it down here is one of the smaller ones due to its size, um, but the further away from the sun you go, you can be the same size and have a bigger um, hill sphere. So Pluto and the dwarf planet Eris have much larger hill spheres around them than we do because they're so much further from the sun. So the sun's gravity at that distance is less of an obstacle to overcome. So in the context of the Oort cloud, this is a diagram of the sun and Alpha Centauri the star system next door, just uh, over four light years away. And we can work out that with the mass of the sun being equal to one unit, um, we can work out that one third of the hill sphere is 0.76 of a uh, light year. So anything in that first three quarters of a light year is within the gravitational dominance of the sun. And that's because the total mass of the three stars at Alpha Centauri is just over double that of the Sun. Um, there's a yellow G-type star with 1.1 solar masses, an orange star at 0.9 solar masses, and the red dwarf Proxima Centauri at 10% the mass of the Sun. So if you add all of that up, you find that that lot together has a hill sphere that's about double the size. So anything in this gray region around Alpha Centauri is going to stick with Alpha Centauri. Anything in this region with the sun is going to stick with the sun, um, unless of course they're zipping through too fast or whatever. But if they can, they're, it's perfectly possible to orbit in this region and the influence of Alpha Centauri next door will be negligible is what we're saying. And then there's a region between the two where you could be um, under the influence of, of both and you'd have to take account of the gravity of both systems um, in this gap between. And you also have to take into account the, uh, the influence of the rest of the galaxy and you can do that calculation as well and you find that there's a region around the sun that's nearly four light years uh, in size um, and in which the sun is the dominant object um, and even bigger region around Alpha Centauri. And so really these two sit in their own uh, combined bubble at the moment um, and then fight it out for control between them as we've seen. Now that's very interesting because when we look at the origin of the Oort cloud Part of it comes from just leftover material from the solar nebula out of which the sun was born. And of course, the same process would have been happening around 
other stars and particularly around uh, the Alpha Centauri stars as well. So they presumably also have uh, Oort clouds around them. And in that region between the two stars, no doubt there are bodies that are under the joint control of both systems and it would be hard to distinguish where one Oort cloud finished and where the next began. And we know that uh, material does seem to be exchanged from time to time between solar systems. About a year ago, we saw this object Oumuamua that came through the solar system and back out the other side, it obviously been formed somewhere else um, and was zipping through our solar system. And so it may have become ejected from its parent system and uh, just now wandering the galaxy and fell into contact with us. But uh, another possible source of that material is from further in, in the, the Kuiper Belt region, because of what's being animated here, which is the early days of the solar system with the giant planets. And it starts here with five giant planets, runs the simulation forward, and all the green stuff is the Kuiper Belt. And at about 20 million years, chaos ensues, and there is a complete rearrangement. One of the giant planets here marked in red gets kicked out here, coming up there. That elliptical orbit is the fifth giant planet getting kicked out. Some of the other four swap places um, and the nicely defined green belt of the Kuiper belt with millions of objects in it gets scattered every which way, as you can see there. And some of that material may have been sent uh, right out into the outer solar system to become part of the Oort cloud. Now we sort of talked about these as icy bodies and uh, this chap here has made his own comet out of uh, frozen carbon dioxide and dirt, which is not a far off uh, description. There's quite a lot of these ices, the water, methane, other hydrocarbons, ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, carbon monoxide, all frozen up, all these volatile materials, as well as a certain amount of rock and dust and gas that's all mixed in together. And so probably not, well, not more than 2% of that. So 98 to 99% of the composition is the volatile substances. But one to 2% is the asteroidal rocky metal chunks. And we think that some of the objects in the uh, Earth cloud are probably mostly rocky, but not very many of them, just 1% uh, maybe. From the sizes of the Oort cloud objects, and the comets particularly that we see coming in, we can try to make an estimate of how much stuff there is out there. And you can see the table here. So small objects less than a kilometer, there are probably trillions of them. And if you go up in steps of 10 on size, you probably go down in steps of about a thousand on uh, the number of objects. So quite a sharp drop off. So uh, a few billion objects up to 10 kilometers in size, a few million up to 100, a few thousand up to the size of Pluto, and then larger objects less than 10, it says here. So probably just one or two or something. Um, and the total mass adds up to about five Earth masses, uh, but it's of course scattered out over a huge volume. Now we also think, as it says on the last line there, that quite a lot of the original mass of the Oort cloud has been either consumed uh, by the sun or by the giant planets as a result of them gobbling up um, in falling comets over the life of the uh, solar system. So 
we've probably lost 95% of that mass of the original Oort cloud, uh, it's thinned out a lot. We also think that there's probably some substructure to it and that there's a sort of inner flat plane, perhaps with a couple of bubbles above and below that uh, form the inner part of the Oort cloud and then the main outer part is just a sphere. The reason we think this is because this is logically as an extension of the Kuiper belt and the scattered disk, which is flat. And there's got to be a point at which it goes from being flat to not being flat and being thoroughly spherical. And it's likely that that's a continuous uh, process rather than a sharp cutoff point. And then on the uh, two bubbles at north and south of the, the sun here, those are probably where some of the material getting scattered by encounters with giant planets ends up into those two bubbles. That's quite likely. But this all remains theoretical or hypothetical because we've not detected the Oort cloud at all yet. It's all supposition. This is uh, a photograph of Comet Halley almost at its uh, aphelion point, 28 astronomical units from the sun and fading rapidly. Because once these objects go out beyond the ice line that's around Jupiter, the temperature drops to the point where they don't form a tail anymore and so you very much lose sight of them. The tail makes them so much brighter when they're in the inner solar system. Now that tells us that it's going to be really quite difficult to detect things like Halley's Comet uh, a thousand times further away a thousand times further away, they're going to be a million times less bright. So it's going to be really quite difficult, given that this is about the limits that our telescopes can manage at the moment. But there is an idea that, called the Whipple mission to not look for the light from these objects, but to look for the absence of light when these objects move in front of background stars. If we saw the characteristic wink of a background star, we could work out uh, the mass and the speed of movement or the size of the obscuring object, whether it was going to cover the whole of the star or any part of the starlight will tell us the size and the speed of movement is determines the uh, length of this miniature eclipse, which we call an occultation. And in fact, the Kepler uh, Space Telescope mission was using that same technique to look for repeated transits of exoplanets, planets around other stars, causing a dip in the light curve. Um, and buried in that Kepler data, there might already be uh, detectable occultations, transits, if you like, of uh, objects from the Oort cloud transiting in front of distant stars. Uh, the difficulty might be that they only do it once and then it's such a long time before anything else happens that we would not be around to see it. And so it's uh, quite difficult to infer that something is definitely a transit. Although if you've got high enough resolution data, then you can work out the shape of the light curve as the object comes in and goes out of the line of sight, and that might help uh, identify some. So we don't know it's there. What about going to look for it? Can we send a probe? Well, the Voyager and Pioneer probes um, are leaving the solar system as we speak. Voyager 1 and 2 were launched in the 1970s and they've officially crossed out into interstellar space. They crossed the termination shock uh, some time ago. In fact, Voyager 1 crossed that region, the termination shock where the solar in wind runs out of momentum against the uh, uh, pressure of interstellar gas. Uh, it crossed that boundary in 94 
and is traveling away from us at 61,000 kilometers every hour. It's going to take another 300 years to reach the Oort cloud though. So that's Voyager 1. Voyager 2 is not so far behind. It's 123 astronomical units from the Sun, moving a little bit slower um, at only 55,000 kilometers per hour um, and in a completely different direction as the chart shows. And sadly, we're no longer in contact with the Pioneer probes, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 that also left the solar system. Um, the last contact from Pioneer 11 was in 1995 and in, for Pioneer 10 it was the 23rd of January 2003, so eight years ago that we lost Pioneer 10. Now we think that we'll be able to keep in touch with the Voyagers for about another 20 years before they'll be so far away and they're on board thermo isotope uh, generating packs will not be able to uh, generate enough power to keep them from freezing up. So we'll probably lose them in maybe, maybe 20 or 30 years time. This is where they are. They crossed the termination shock some time ago. They've gone beyond the helio sheath and out into interstellar space proper. So they're completely outside the uh, electromagnetic influence of the sun now. The other probe that's uh, on its way out there, going to tell us useful things, is New Horizons that flew past Pluto and then on past uh, Ultima Thule, good old uh, Arakoff 2014 MU69 to give it its designation, and is now way beyond that, uh, flying out at very high speed. It's not quite the fastest, um, it's uh, slower than Voyager 1 but uh, it's traveling at 47,000 kilometers per hour and it's going to leave the solar system at quite a high rate. So that will be another potential uh, way of probing some of what's going on out there. But again, 300 years or more before it e even reaches the inner part of the Earth cloud. But I like this mission. This is the Tau probe. And it was put forward as an idea in 1987 to send a probe out, taking 50 years to travel to a distance of a thousand astronomical units from the sun and remain in contact. And the idea was that they were going to use it to measure the parallax of uh, stars. We do that using the baseline of the Earth's orbit. So the Earth goes around the Sun, we get a baseline for our triangles that's got a uh, side here of 150 million kilometers. And so we can measure the shape of these triangles if we can measure this angle, which is the same as this angle, which is the position that the nearby star appears to be at compared to the very much further distant ones. That's called the parallax method. And by doing that, we can estimate the distance to at least the nearby stars really quite well. Um, but if we had the Tau probe sat a thousand AU away, we would increase our baseline from one astronomical unit to a thousand astronomical units and thereby make this job a thousand times easier to do. In other words, we could look at stars that were that much further away. And that would be very useful in terms of mapping the nearby star systems. But of course, at 1000 AU, it is more or less at that inner part of the uh, Oort cloud. And it would be very interesting to see if such a probe could be launched and could return some data. But it is going to take 50 years and that has not been funded as a project probably because this 50 years is too long a time frame for anyone to consider. So the Oort cloud is still in the realms of hypothetical. It's probably out there. It's probably the source of the long period comets raining down. It probably gets perturbed now and again by 
passing stars like Schultz's star. Um, it's possible that our Oort cloud and that of Alpha Centauri are nudging into each other and material is getting swapped from one to the other and eventually that may come our way. So we want, need to watch out for that because in most of these things anything that can happen does happen. <clears throat> and uh, yet we've never detected a single body from it. So it's going to be interesting to see when the first discovery of an object in an orbit that far away from the sun is made. Um, and uh, we just don't know when that's going to be. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the Oort cloud and what we know and what we still don't know. And uh, I will bring that to a halt just there. <laughs>